Hello, and welcome to our Monday Supper. Each week, we welcome you into our home to talk about important issues around our state. And my husband, Mike Vasca, is race for state attorney general. Tonight, we'll be discussing and celebrating the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote in our country. Today, I'm happy to share that women represent the majority of voters in Washington state and hold many important leadership positions. Like our guest, Secretary of State Kim Wyman, who is the chief executive of the agency that runs our elections and also provides important state services to businesses and nonprofit organizations. Welcome to the show, Kim. We'll talk with Kim about our state's pioneering work shifting to mail-in ballots and its success, knock on wood, in keeping out foreign hackers. Our second guest is Mary Cuny, who has been on our show before. Mary is a Spokane County Commissioner, and in that role, she serves on the County Board of Health. Welcome back, Mary. Spokane is now reopening its economy while also facing a spike in COVID-19 cases. And we'll ask Mary what lessons we can all learn from that experience. Finally, Mike will talk with Mary and Kim about the future of women in politics and what he as attorney general and others can do to make sure that women continue to advance. Now I'll turn it over to our family's pick to be your next attorney general, my husband, Mike Vasca. Thank you, Camille. Hello, everyone. There are women living in this state today who were born at a time when women were not guaranteed the right to vote in this country. One of them is Fritzi Bryant, who is 106 years old and was born six years before the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed a woman's right to vote. Washington State was a leader in what was called the women's suffrage movement. Washington became the fifth state in the nation to allow women to vote in state elections a full 10 years before the 19th Amendment was ratified by the entire country in 1920. Our state's leadership on the right to vote may go way back to when Meriwether Lewis and William Clark held the first vote by Americans in the West. They held it on the banks of the Columbia River in what would become Washington State. The Lewis and Clark expedition was commissioned by Thomas Jefferson to plant the ideals of the American Revolution in the West. In deciding where to make winter camp, the two leaders asked every man to cast a vote, including the black slave York. They also asked the lone woman, a Native American called Sacagawea, to vote. This story was portrayed in a picture on the cover of the 1998 Voter's Guide. Here it is. 50 years before the 13th Amendment to the Constitution ended slavery and 100 years before the 19th Amendment guaranteed women the right to vote, a slave and a woman were asked to vote in the territory that would become our state. Tonight we are joined by the highest ranking woman elected to office in our state, Secretary of State Kim Wyman. We'll talk with Kim about the progress women have made in our society, where there may be room to advance, and how she protects your right to vote from foreign interference. But before we get to Kim, let's get an update on COVID-19 in Eastern Washington from Spokane County Commissioner, Mary Cuny. Mary, are you with us? I am. So thank you very much for having me on the show tonight with you. It's a pleasure to come back um, and be on with you. Um, so COVID-19 in Spokane County, it's, um, we've been in phase two now for about uh, five weeks and we're seeing a spike in our cases. And so that's uh, you know, definitely concerning to us. Um, there's a lot of people that know that the commissioners after three weeks of being in, in the phase two had put a letter forward to our health officer. And so with that, our cases weren't rising at that point uh, and our hospital capacity was good. Um, since that point, we have seen a, a dramatic change in, in that. And so it's been important for us to then look at doing community outreach and having discussions with our hospitals to see where we're at and what we're doing there. So Mary, just so I'm clear, you're in phase two now, is that right? So we, we are currently in phase two and we we're hoping to go to phase three after that three week time period. 
Um, but since that point, we have seen a dramatic spike in our, our numbers. Um, and we've also seen an increase in our hospitalizations. And so it was important for us, um, for any county to choose to go forward. You know, you need a letter from the health officer as well as the hospitals to say that they're ready. Um, and so we had a community conversation with our hospitals, Providence system and multi-care system. And they are seeing an uptick in, in hospitalization. So that's concerning. Uh, and so that's part of why we're, we're kind of in a pause at this point in time. Um, so, so yeah, so today was actually, you know, just so you know, 79 new cases today in Spokane County. Well, you're well served by two great hospitals, Deaconess and Sacred Heart. I've had the pleasure of doing work for Sacred Heart over the years um, on expanding their capacity to provide services and, um, you know, world-class hospital, um, you've got great care and I'm sure you'll manage it. Let me, let me ask you this question. Uh, Governor Inslee called the situation in Spokane very dire and said that Spokane County is, in his words, on the verge of a runaway pandemic. What's your assessment of where you're at right now? So I don't think we're on the verge of a runaway pandemic. I think what, what, we're, what we're seeing is um, situations like we have some that have uh, minority populations that have multi-generational um, families within that same household. And so when one gets it, then it, it tends to spread throughout the entire family. I think as we've seen when we went to phase two with contact tracing and more testing going on, um, I think that's part of why we're seeing more concentrated numbers um, that we can say are epi-linked um, versus community spread. Uh, with, you know, we're a border county with the state of Idaho. So Coeur d'Alene is right next to us, which is in phase four. And so as the summer season hits, we've got people going to the lakes and people are back and forth between those communities. And so I think that's part of why we're seeing our spike. But I, I will say that, you know, talking to the hospitals, that wearing face coverings is really gonna help us to prevent that spread. I was in Pullman, people were wearing face coverings there. I'm in Seattle right now, people are wearing their face coverings here. Spokane has been a little lax at that. And so I think that's one of the things that I would suggest to counties as, as you move forward is to ensure that people are really wearing those face coverings because the hospitals are saying it really truly does make a difference. Uh, any other um, lessons that counties around the state can learn from your experience in Spokane other than wear face coverings, please people. It's not that hard and it can save lives. It can save lives and it's, it's, it's truly that. I've seen the Be Kind campaign over here and, and we're looking at spread kindness, not COVID. Um, so I would say that's definitely a, a message to get out there. And, and like I said, I think with the contact tracing, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we're seeing what's happening. I, I would also say that we're seeing a huge spike in the numbers of 20 to 29. And so it's, it's that generation that needs to really take this seriously. If you have just a change in taste, that's one of the symptoms that you may not have any other symptoms. So if you're putting more salt or hot sauce, things to look out for, and, and I, would, I would suggest that. Um, and as the restaurants and bars are opening, um, you know, it's, it's still being very mindful of, of your fellow citizens and, and, and watching that. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, we're gonna come back to you in just a few minutes. Um, hello, Kim Wyman, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay, there you are. I didn't do a good entrance earlier. It was like, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to turn my camera on. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. We're, uh, we're all learning here. Um, well, let me start by saying, how special is it for you to be the highest ranking elected official in our state overseeing elections during the 100th anniversary of the women gaining the right to vote under the United States Constitution. Oh, it's, it's just a great honor. And I'm so proud of Washington and the fact that we have always been a, a national leader and on the forefront of really important voting issues like women's suffrage. And I think probably everyone watching this knows that Washington actually gave women the right to vote 10 years before uh, Congress, uh, the 19th Amendment was passed and ratified by Congress and uh, ratified by the states, excuse me. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of that. And in fact, one of my political heroes is the first woman statewide elected Republican uh, office holder, and that was Josephine Corliss Preston. She was a superintendent of public instruction 
She was elected in 1912, two years after women got the right to vote in our state and a full eight years before the 19th Amendment was passed. And she was the first, and I am the second statewide Republican woman to hold office in Washington state. So it took a hundred years to, uh, to repeat that feat that Josephine started. So I'm, I'm really honored to, to be able to oversee the elections this year and, uh, and be part of history in that way. So you're the second statewide elected Republican. Is that what I heard you say? Second statewide woman Republican. Right. Uh, yes. I think we're gonna increase your numbers this year. Uh, we'll see, of course. Um, all right, well, let me ask you this. Um, have you taken part in any celebra celebrations so far? Uh, and if so, any good stories to tell? I'm curious if you've met these 106 year old people that were alive before uh, women had the right to vote, at least at the national level. Uh, unfortunately not. You know, I think that's the one of the many casualties of the COVID-19 lockdowns. Uh. Yeah. Is a lot of these great planned celebrations have had to be canceled. But uh, one fun event I got to be part of was held at the Washington State Historical uh, Society at the, the Washington uh, the, the Museum in Tacoma. There we go. And it was uh, the little black dress. And it was a, a parade of women uh, starting with State Senator Karen Frazier and uh, a number of just great elected officials uh, and, and people who are leaders in their communities from across the state. And we got to wear period pieces of the little black dress going back to uh, the 1800s. And it was just a, a really fun night. And it was a, I thought it was gonna be a great kickoff to the uh, anniversary of women's suffrage, uh, the centennial. But unfortunately it, it uh, was, looks like might be one of the only celebrations we get to do in person. So I have to ask, what's the, what's the little black dress? What is that? <laughs> so it, it is a phenomenon that was actually created by a fashion phenomenon created by Coco Chanel in the uh, at the turn of the 20th century, and she was a, a little bit um, racy, I think, for her time. And uh, you know, up until that time, the a black dress was something women wore in mourning. You know, if they lost their husband or a family member, and so the you know the eighteen late eighteen hundreds women wearing a black dress signified something really negative. Well, Coco Chanel, who you know liked to party a little bit, uh, decided to be scandalous in the twenties, and she created the, what what is now known today as the little black dress, and she really. Um, you know, spice things up. And so it was really chronicling how black dresses have uh, changed throughout time. And it really does mirror the political realities and the cultural realities of women in the United States. So it was a really fun, fun event to be part of. All right, I wanna to talk to you and Mary about this important anniversary in just a minute, but let me first ask you some questions about our state's election system. So first off, I've heard that spies from Russia and maybe other countries have tried to hack into our state computers. What can you tell us about that? You might know more about it than you can tell us, but what can you tell us about that? I, uh, it is indeed true. In 2016, uh, we now know it was Russia that was trying to get into our system. In uh, 2016, about July, we started seeing activity on our servers that was not normal. We blocked that activity and notified the FBI and Homeland Security. Later found out it was Russian foreign actors. So uh, we have actually been kind of on the forefront in many respects here in Washington because we have our tabulation systems that are not connected to the computer. We call it air gapping. So that uh, the only way you could get into a tabulation system would be to be on site and get past all of the cyber and, and physical security measures that the county has in place to prevent that. We also have our voter registration system, which we've spent the last three years modernizing. And uh, I'm really proud to tell you that that allowed us over the course of the last couple of years to really build up our cyber defenses. Our nation is now a uh, uh, excuse me, the president has now uh, declared elections critical infrastructure, which means we are part of the national security network that uh, all of our federal partners um, protect. That would include, you know, things like the power grid, the banking system. And so the election system is considered national security and critical infrastructure. So that has really allowed us 
to expand our federal resources and uh, put money into really investing in that cybersecurity that has prepared us for 2020. So I'm very proud to tell you as we sit here today, we have plans in place, um, continuity of operation plans if things go wrong. And in fact, that really helped us prepare for COVID-19. And uh, I, I think uh, anybody that was watching the nightly news tonight got to see uh, your own Secretary of State on, uh, on Lester Holt's show and talking about uh, what we're doing here in Washington. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Well, darn it, I missed that. I watched about five minutes and then I had to get ready for the show. So, uh, right. but I do tape it, so I will go check it out. Well, I know there's somewhat different apples to oranges maybe, but why has your office been able to keep the cyber criminals at bay while the Employment Security Department, which is under the governor, had $600 million stolen from it by Nigerian cyber criminals? I have no idea. <laughs> You know, I, I am to a point in my life where I realize that I have to focus on the things that I can control and influence. And, uh, you know, my responsibility as Secretary of State is to answer to all of you. I, I'm directly elected by the people of Washington State, and uh, I, I take full responsibility for our election system and, and making sure that that's secure and that your vote is protected and your voter registration information is protected. I'm sorry, but I can't weigh in on what happened with employment security. It's a, you know, it's a challenge, and and uh, I I do hope they can recover the money that was lost. Well, one of the things that uh, I admire about you, and I think the voters, the people of our state admire, is that you um, are you run an office that's very transparent. Um, people can see what you're doing, and warts and all. Um, and I don't think that's something we can say about. Um, all aspects of state government. Um, and certainly on this employment security breach, uh, there's been a huge lack of transparency. I think it's fair to say we really don't know much about what's going on. There may be good reasons for that. Uh, it'll eventually come out, but uh, very different than how you're running your office. Um, well, uh, many other parts of the country are looking at mail-in voting this year because of COVID-19 concerns. Of course, we moved to an all-mail system many years ago here. Do you have any advice for those other parts of the country that are looking at or maybe required to adopt our system? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm kind of proud to tell you that uh, Washington is such a leader in vote by mail and expanded absentees. And I think everyone watching knows why. You know, we really started giving voters the choice to move to absentee voting in the 1990s uh, by the uh, infamous 2000 election, uh, Rossi Gregoire. Um, we had 60% of our voters voting by mail. And what we learned from that election is that you really can't do a vote by mail election and a polling place election simultaneously and do both well. And I think a lot of the things that you all remember that didn't go well at the polling place and in the absentee environment came from not having good internal controls. And that's really why I mentioned this. Um, those lessons learned are what led us to become a vote by mail state is that we really needed to just cross over and focus our energies and resources on that. And it still took our state five years once we wanted to in 2005, it still took five years to convert over to vote by mail because our bigger counties needed time to build out their control systems and their processing systems. And, uh, and in, in Pierce County's case, they were the last county to move to vote by mail. It was political. Their voters didn't want to move to, to vote by mail and it took the legislature forcing it. So um, we've now had, uh, you know, since 2011, we've been a vote by mail state. And I, I think my biggest concern nationally is the time. Are they going to have enough time to, you know, to do the, the internal controls and the, the security measures that you need to inspire confidence in those harsh critics like the president? And uh, um, my biggest concern is, is that we're running out of time. Well, once again, um, we're ahead of the curve in Washington State on voting. Um, we're gonna bring Mary Cuny, Spokane County Commissioner, back into the conversation about the 100th anniversary of a woman's right to vote in this country. And, uh, but first, um, you've probably heard the story of how then Attorney General Slade Gorton hired Christine Gregoire as a lawyer during a time when many private law firms would not hire women. She went on to be the first woman deputy attorney general, and then to be elected the first woman attorney general in our state. Of course, she was then elected governor. 
Let me ask you both if you if you've seen progress in your lifetimes in the inclusion of women in politics. Uh, Mary, why don't we start with you and then then we'll take Kim. Okay, and and I'll say one of the celebrations that Kim was going to have was coming over to Eastern Washington to Hutton Settlement because May Arkwright Hutton was one of the leaders in helping women get the right to vote in the state of Washington. So we are very sad not to have that. And I'm actually on the Hutton Settlement Board today that is a, you know, a orphanage started off as an orphanage that's 100 years old as well. And so um, so it's it's an honor to be part of an uh, organization that has celebrated women, you know, all these years. Um, so so it's sad to see that celebration not happen. Um, but I think for, for me, uh, women in politics, being a county commissioner, you know, we're at, you know, about 28 female county commissioners across the state out of 135 between commissioners and council members. Um, and so it's interesting um, to see that disparity when in the legislature we're, we're almost at a, you know, 50, 50, um, you know, Kim sees it from her position. So, um, I, you know, I'm always advocating for, for other women, uh, cause I think we needed, we need all of our voices at the table as, as we move forward. Okay. Uh, and go uh, ahead, Kim. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, yeah, I would, I would totally agree with, uh, with Mary. Absolutely. The, the thing I've seen probably in my 20 years of being elected is um, kind of a shift in the way that that women work together and try to help each other get elected. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that the fact that it took 100 years for a second Republican woman to be elected statewide kind of speaks volumes about our state because women have held almost every election uh, or every position in our state. Uh, and almost all of the statewide election elected offices. And clearly it's Democratic women. You know, the Democratic uh, Party does a much better job apparently of, of getting their, um, their women elected officials through the campaign season and, and across the finish line first. And, and I think that, uh, you know, some of the work that I do on a national level is working with some groups to do a, a project called Right Women Right Now and trying to attract more women uh, who, who lean on the conservative side to run for office and, and try to become you know, political leaders and elected leaders in their communities and be ready for those opportunities when they present themselves. Um, I don't do it too much in our state overtly because overseeing the election, I always try to keep that balance. And you know, like this year, I'm not endorsing any candidates directly because of just the, the, the firestorm that's happening on, on so many fronts related to elections and the allegations of people you know, either voter fraud or voter suppression, pick your, pick your side of the aisle. So, um, you know, but, but I do try to, to help and assist. And I think that that's one thing that I've seen is a, a difference in when I first was elected, I, I didn't have as many women trying to help me or support me. And so, you know, change the world a little at a time, I guess. Well, and, and Spokane just elected a woman to mayor. And I read or heard somewhere that the majority of women in local elected positions executive positions in our state are women. By executive, I mean county treasurers, auditors, folks like that. Um, it, am, I, am I getting that right? And, and a lot of those are in uh, Republican counties. So it, it sounds like progress is being made kind of at that level, even if it hasn't all bubbled up. Of course, you came out of um, a county executive position, uh, Kim. Um, are, you, are you seeing progress at that level in our state? We're starting to, and, and I think some of that is the, the nature of the work. When you look at the, the county treasurer or assessor or auditor, those are, are clerical positions by and large, historically. And you have women that were able to get those positions you know, in, in government and work their way up. And I, I think that's where a lot of the pipeline for a lot of those executive office holders at the county level comes from. And I think that um, what we're starting to see and is exciting with all of the um, the appeal of younger voters, and especially the things that happened in 2018, is more younger women are starting to say, you know what, I'm going to figure out a way to run. And uh, you know, I, I think that that women it tends to be at the point in your life when you can. Um, and this is not to be disparaging of men, but I think it's just a you know the the reality of women you know, in the childbearing years, when you start having children and start building a family, it's really hard to balance being an elected official and a mom and a wife 
you know, and the, the soccer mom and all of the, the, the hats that we wear. And I think that as we're moving forward, there's again, a lot more support amongst women to make sure that those things can happen. Mary, if, if I recall correctly, you were an assistant um, county treasurer in Spokane. I think it was treasurer um, before you became county commissioner. What are you seeing um, with women advancing into executive positions in, in counties? So I was actually the uh, chief deputy auditor um, in Spokane County. So I knew it so, was one or the other. <laughs> right. So oversaw the elections office as well. And so I can I can attest to the fact that, you know, Secretary of State uh, Wyman has done an excellent job in helping us with our election systems. Um, I, I think, you know, as, as uh, Kim was just talking about, you know, I actually waited. Um, I was a state auditor for several years, took some time off with my kids and then became the chief deputy auditor and then had the opportunity to to go for an appointment. I, you know, I think, you know, for me, the timing was just right that, you know, my kids were old enough and, and kind of on their own. My son was driving um, to, to do that. So I think it's, you know, we do, it's, it's helping support women, um, so that they feel that they can do, you know, all the things they need to do to be successful as a mom and as a wife and, and in our community. And I think, again, it's like, I think, you know, having that balance of, of thinking is, is, is crucial and, and, and really works well. Well, uh, it looks like our county, our country, and our state have come a long way since women were given the right to vote. Do um, either of you have suggestions for how we recruit and help elect even more women in our state? And, and also, can uh, someone like an attorney general, the job I'm seeking, uh, help out in that? Uh, we'll start with Mary. Um, so I, I think it's it's just providing that platform that um, you know again that support and that platform for women to know that they've got the the ability to do it um, and that that they'll be great at it um, that we don't have to know everything to be running for office. I think a lot of times as women we feel like we need to know everything about everything, and and we don't. Um, there's a lot of learning on the job, and it's a lot of having that confidence and that wisdom to know that you can make good decisions. Um, so I think that's, you know, for me, one of the key pieces for helping to support women and, and get them in those roles. And I think you as, uh, you know, our next, you know, attorney general, that, that would be the same, you know, uh, role that I would have ask of you to, to just be supportive. Okay. Well, one yeah. of the things that I learned in, uh, in this Right Woman Right Now program, which has been really insightful, is that, um, women are different than men in terms of how you recruit them to run for office. And if you have two, two candidates, a male and a female candidate, same resume, same background, same exact experience, and you ask both of them, hey, have you thought about running for whatever position? 70% of men, seven zero, will say, oh yeah, I'm qualified. 40% of women will say that I'm qualified. Those same women and same men. Now, when you talk to the woman, you say, well, Mary, you know, you'd be great on the school board. You know, you're already involved in the PTA. You're at school every day. You know the issues. You'd be great. Women come up to that 70% level, but they have to be asked to the dance. And it's a real different dynamic. And I don't know what it is about women, but, but they, they just have to think it through and they have to really be asked multiple times. I've heard you have to be asked three times before you think about running. And so I think we have to be cognizant of that. And, and it does go back to those childcare issues and those, that, that period of time that you're in in your life. Um, I, I got into politics when my daughter was eight and uh, my son was five and they're now grown adults. And I mentioned that because I was very fortunate one to have a job that was eight to five Monday through Friday by and large, being in, in a, a single county. And um, when I was county auditor, I had a husband who was there to, to totally say, this is a, um, a family affair. We're in this together. We're going to do this and make it happen. And, you know, you have to have that. And if that, that candidate doesn't have that for some reason, people need to step up and make sure that somebody is going to be there on Tuesday nights for the city council meeting to watch the kids. And, you know, maybe somebody needs to help mow the lawn or whatever those things are. And then, you know, that's one of the ways we get more women into office is support wherever they are in their lives to be able to, to run. I heard about a project that was very successful in Utah 
where, and I'm not sure exactly how it was organized, but the goal was to get more women to run for office. And they convinced uh, party leaders, uh, I think in particular the Republican Party, but maybe the Democrats as well, and church leaders, as well as other leaders in the state, to say it out loud, we need more women to run, we want more women to run. And um, that coupled with some of the things that you've described made a big difference. The number of women running for office went way up. So sometimes it may be as simple as just saying it out loud, which, you know, we don't always hear that. Um, uh, so, well, um, uh, you both have re-election campaigns this year. Um, let me just give you a chance to talk a little bit about how your campaigns are going and any issues you want to highlight that you're running on and any other information you want to share with uh, the people watching the show. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Oh, you go, go first and then Mary. Okay, I'm trying to get in the, the right light here. It's impossible. The sun's starting to set over here. Um, so campaign is going really well. I'm, I'm really proud to tell everyone watching that uh, we're working really hard and uh, our fundraising has really been our focus since uh, middle of April. It was, I think every candidate had the same issue to wrestle with. When do you start asking people for money? But um, I'm really proud to tell you that since the uh, at April 10th, which was after the freeze, we've had over 3,500 people contribute to our campaign. And it's a, it's a broad base of support. And a lot of those contributors are, you know, smaller donors. And, uh, you know, I think that gives us a lot of momentum going into the primary in general. But uh, beyond that, we have the, the endorsements of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, which I think is in essential in the role that I serve as a chief election officer, and really have a message of the importance of that nonpartisan approach to the office. And it's really, I think, been effective because my opponent and the Washington State Democrats have targeted my race and uh, are working very hard to try to show that I'm a Trump Republican or I'm somehow, you know, um, very beholden to the party and I'm going to try to, you know, I guess, cheat on the elections or something. And uh, every time they raise those, those uh, accusations, it's really fun to talk about the broad base of, of support that we've earned by being the fair umpire and being that neutral party that oversees elections. So um, otherwise, uh, we're, we're just really trying to continue to have safe and secure elections that are accessible and fair. We are uh, trying to modernize our archives and library building, uh, or library by building a building that will put them into you know 21st century conditions and uh, trying to make it easier to do business in Washington. So uh, we're going to keep working hard all the way right up until November 10th, because I figure we'll work hard past election day and, uh, you know, support's going, going well. That's Kim Wyman, Washington's incumbent Secretary of State running for re-election. Uh, she needs your support. And now Mary Cuny, uh, Spokane County Commissioner, you also have a challenger, I believe. How is your campaign going so far? Thank you. Now I do have a challenger as well. And um, I think it's going really well. I think, you know, we are in challenging times to campaign. And as a county commissioner with everything going on with COVID, it's, um, it's you know, been very interesting being vice chair of the health board. Uh, I, I will tell you that my days are spent on Zooms and I'm sure Kim can, you know, we can all say the same thing on, on Zoom and phone calls. And so your evenings then get taken up with additional phone calls that you need to follow up with those conversations. And then uh, look at campaigning, you know, with not being able to have those gatherings, uh, it's harder uh, to, you know, to fundraise and all that. So I, I think we're doing pretty, pretty well. And as Kim said, it was, you know, it's that tricky part of knowing what was going on with COVID and where people are in the economic cycle of things, you know, when, when was the right time to start to ask for money, but, but we know that we're doing great things for our communities and for the state and in Kim's case that, that you do just, you have to ask because you need to make sure that you're, you, we stay there so that way we can continue to do those great things for our community. I've, I've been blessed with, um, honestly, you know, bipartisan support in Spokane, even though I'm, I'm a Republican, uh, because I think people are really seeing that this is a time where we need to come together to do the right thing for the community. And so that's, that's the, you know, what I'm blessed and, and, and been my focus is that, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you know, it's really, we're here, you know, with our values that we're bringing to our community to make it better. I've had the pleasure of serving 
on a board that I chaired with Mary Cuny, and I can tell you she is an excellent public servant and one of the future stars of our party. Of course, Kim is already a star, so I don't have to tell you that. Um, to wrap up, do either of you have any thoughts on how we should all be celebrating the 100th anniversary of a woman's right to vote? Is there anything else we should be doing this year? I think the, the biggest one is is voting. It, it is right now while you're thinking about it, go and check on votewa.gov the status of your registration. If you're not registered, get registered. If you are, make sure we have your accurate address or if you change your name, update it, particularly women who've gotten married recently. Um, but, but mainly keeping that information up to date so we can get you a ballot on the first try. And uh, you know, I think the best way we can honor those those women who went before us, the, the sisterhood of, uh, uh, of suffrage is, is to vote. And, uh, you know, this is, an, is not only a right, but it is something that, you know, a really tough group of women uh, went through some really awful things to make sure that we had that right that is so easy to take for granted. So I think the, the best thing we can do to honor them is to, uh, to participate in every election. And we're called I, suffragettes after all. That's all right. right. And Go ahead, Mary. Completely echo what Kim said, and and to know that every vote truly counts. You know, as Kim knows, there's elections across the state that are down to one vote, and so it truly is important for everyone to to exercise their right to vote. That and you know, and honor those people that have gone before us to make sure we have that right. Well, thank you both for joining us tonight, and uh, good luck on your elections this year. I don't think you have much to worry about, but. Uh, who knows? Um, I like to tell the story about the first American vote in the West during the Lewis and Clark expedition because it shows the power of combining a pioneering spirit with the ideals of the American Revolution. A black slave and a Native American woman were allowed to vote along with the rest of the Corps of Discovery about the location of their winter camp. It was important to get it right. It could be a matter of life or death, so everyone's insights were needed. Lewis and Clark were generations ahead of their time, but they were inspired by the ideals of the founding fathers as expressed in the Declaration of Independence, written by the man who sent them west. When Thomas Jefferson wrote those words, dedicating the new United States to the proposition that all men were created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, this lofty goal was very different than reality at that time. Some men were enslaved, Women could not vote. And yet, as generations passed, the ideals of the revolution started to become reality, often first among the pioneers in the West and sometimes first in our state. So as we consider the need to address issues of equality in our society, and we need to address these issues, let's also remember and honor the great progress we have made within the system of government given to us by our founders. In celebrating the 100th anniversary of a woman's right to vote, we also honor our great country that despite all its many flaws, continues to make steady progress toward the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Thank you for joining us tonight. To learn more about my campaign for Attorney General, please visit my website at www.mikevasca.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.